Hello, my name is Paige, and I'm an adoptive parent inquiry specialist for the Snowflakes Embryo Adoption Program through Nightlight Christian Adoptions, as well as the Education Coordinator and Social Media Manager for the Embryo Adoption Awareness Center. This video you are about to watch is everything you need to know about embryo donation and adoption. We're going to dive deep into what is embryo donation and adoption, who pursues these avenues for the remaining embryos or family building purposes and why, and what aspects you should take into account when thinking of pursuing this route yourself. You may be watching this video for educational purposes, for your own embryo adoption or donation process, or you may simply just be curious. Either way, I hope you take away from this video a lot of good information and a better understanding of the world of embryo donation and adoption. As you can see, we're going to go over a lot of different topics of discussion today. Uh, so all your questions should be answered. But if you have a question that we did not hit on and you would like to ask us, feel free to comment down below or you can send us an email via our website, which we will give at the end of the video. All right, so we're going to start off with a little quick fact here. So did you know today there are over 1 million embryos and frozen storage in the US and the need for donating and adoptive families grows daily? All right, we're going to start off with the most basic question. What is embryo donation and adoption? Well, historically, adoption has been the primary alternative to family building. So years and years and years ago, when a family was not able to have biological children of their own, the first alternative uh, option would be adoption. So infant adoption or adoption from foster care or orphanages back in the day, or even adopting internationally. So research and science now offer solutions like assisted reproductive technology or ART. Um, this includes, but it's not limited to uh, procedures like intrauterine insemination or IUIs or uh, in vitro fertilization or IVF. So this is now the first option many families who are facing infertility will take rather than just jump straight into the adoption route. So this is what happens during IVF, just a brief overview for those who may not know. Um, IVF is when eggs are extracted from the ovaries of the woman. They are then fertilized outside the body with sperm, creating the embryos. These embryos are then transferred back into the woman in hopes of achieving pregnancy. Um, so during IVF treatments, sometimes more embryos are created than will be used for transfers or pregnancy attempts. And this is what's causing the ever increasing number of embryos to be placed in frozen storage, uh, specifically in the United States, because in the US there are no laws regulating the number of embryos created or the number of embryos that can be stored. Um, so this is why the number in the US of frozen embryos is all most likely and probably over 1 million at this time. All right, so very, very brief history of embryo adoption and donation. Uh, so in 1978, the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, was born in the United Kingdom. That's where the first um, successful IVF cycle occurred. Um, more and more families started to pursue IVF after this time to, in hopes of creating their own biological children when they were told they wouldn't be, wouldn't, that wouldn't be a possibility for them. When these embryos started being created, uh, embryologists discovered they could actually freeze embryos for future use. And we'll go over exactly how embryos are fro uh, frozen a little bit later here. Um, but these frozen embryos started building up. Soon clinics started offering these donated remaining embryos to fertility patients at their own clinic, maybe if their own IVF cycles were not successful or, or what that case might be. This is called embryo donation. That's when the process of embryo donation started occurring. So in 1997, that's when the first embryo adoption program was established. It was established by Nightlight Christian Adoptions. That is the Snowflakes Embryo Adoption Program. It essentially started applying the best practices of adoption to the process of embryo donation. So home studies were required, um, both donor and adoptive family vetting. Matching occurred in a very adoption mindset and communication was established between the parties as well. So just fast forwarding to the present, it is estimated that there have been over 10,000 
most likely even more babies born through the process of embryo donation and adoption. And that could be through uh, an embryo adoption program like Snowflakes or through clinic donation programs or just matching privately. It's a, becoming more and more popular each year as time goes on. Okay, so how are embryos actually frozen and stored? How is that even possible? So after embryos are created, any embryos that are not transferred immediately once they re reach the optimal stage for uh, being transferred uh, into the womb, they are cryopreserved and stored for future use. So they are stored uh, at below freezing temperatures. Uh, they are either slow frozen or flash frozen and they can be frozen indefinitely. There is no like set expiration date for embryos to be thawed and then used later for future transfers. So the embryos are frozen between day one to day six of development, though freezing on day five or day six, when the embryo is in a phase called a blastocyst stage, is considered optimal by embryologists. That's when they want to transfer the embryos into the uterus. Now, embryos are stored in what's called canes or straws, and you can kind of see it on the back of the slide here what they look like. Um, so you can store up to three embryos in a straw, um, and that kind of determines uh, is determined by how many embryos were created or need to be stored. So if there's a group of two embryos that need to be stored, they'll probably just be frozen one to a straw. If there is as much as 12 embryos in a group, most likely those embryos will be frozen three to four straws, um, just maximizing the space for, for more embryos. Uh, this is actually going to come into play during your embryo adoption process if you're thinking about pursuing this route. Um, what happens when you thaw embryos, they thaw almost instantaneously. It takes only like one or two minutes and all those embryos will be frozen in the straw. So if you were thawing a straw of three embryos, all three embryos will be thawed. So uh, just something to consider when if you are going through your own uh, embryo adoption process at this time. So many families still have embryos in storage years after they have completed their own families. Um, many are not prepared for this. When families are going through uh, IVF cycles, they're not really thinking, oh, what happens if I have too many of these embryos? Many are thinking like, I really just hope I only, I just get one embryo out of this that I can transfer. Um, it can come as a shock. Uh, many families feel surprised, overwhelmed, and unsure what to do next um, with the remaining embryos after it finally hits them that they most likely will not be using these embryos themselves. So there are mainly four choices for families who have remaining embryos, which are keep the embryos frozen indefinitely, thaw and discard the embryos, donate the embryos to science or research, and the final one is donating the embryos to another family for family building purposes. All right, so each of these choices does have an impact. Um, there are things that come out of each of these choices. The first one is keeping the embryos frozen indefinitely. This is basically not making a decision or putting off a decision, which can seem like the, the or can seem like the easiest choice at the time. So annual storage costs for embryos is about $600. So if this is the route families are choosing to go, they're basically saying that I want to uh, shell out $600 a year just to keep my embryos frozen um, and not have to deal with, with making a decision of them. This really increases the risk that these embryos may become abandoned. The definition of an abandoned embryo is that Basically, the owner of the embryos, because embryos are considered property in the US, ceases to pay storage on these embryos. So nobody is uh, paying for storage on these embryos, and the clinic or the facility that is housing the embryos is not able to discard these embryos for fear of um, facing litigation in the future if that owner were to come back and ask for their um, embryos back or, or, or then come back and want to use them or make a decision on them, whatever have, whatever have you. Um, so they can't really destroy the embryo. So that's what is considered an abandoned embryo. Um, unfortunately, you cannot adopt abandoned embryos. Again, it goes with the fact that these facilities don't want to face litigation if the owner were to come back and find out the embryos were um, adopted out to another 
family or another party. So unfortunately, these embryos are truly abandoned. Uh, this can also leave a difficult decision for others in the event of a death a divorce or other life altering event in the family who has the embryos. Um, all not making decision, putting off, making excuses, and then a divorce happens between the family. Now all of a sudden you have to make a decision on what to do with your embryos. So this can be a very difficult situation for all parties involved. All right, so the second choice is thaw and discard the embryos. A lot of families find this as a quick, simple closure to their dilemma. Uh, this does destroy, effectively destroy the embryo. It cannot be used for science purposes or research purposes or future frozen embryo transfer attempts. Uh, some families may choose to do a special ceremony or like a compassionate transfer uh, when going this route. A compassionate transfer essentially means there's no prep upwards to this transfer. Um, when, when the transfer occurs, it occurs on a day uh, where there's little to no chance that the embryo will actually implant and become a pregnancy. So many families will choose to do that simply to, than just thawing or discarding them. There is another option called a Sacred Heart Guardians and Shelter, where they can offer a burial service to embryos that are not going to be used. So this can offer dignity, comfort, respect um, through the process of a burial service. So some families may choose to go that route. The third option is to donate the embryos to science instead of just simply thawing and discarding them. Um, some may choose this option because they feel like they are making, making a contribution to a scientific discovery. The different uh, research that the embryos could be donated to may be stem cell research in the hope to cure diseases um, or test new pre-genetic uh, testing uh, methods like PGD or PGDA methods. Um, again, ultimately, though, this does destroy the embryo and it cannot be used for future FET attempts, but many will, will, will go this route instead of just, the, like I said before, thawing and just discarding the embryo or doing a compassionate transfer. They feel like they're contributing to scientific discovery. So the final choice is donating the embryos to another family for reproduction. So the term donation is used in the sense of giving a gift to another family, and that's in the literal sense, what is happening? Embryos, you cannot buy or sell embryos in the United States. It is illegal. It, they are considered live human tissue, just like a kidney is considered live human tissue. It is illegal to buy and sell live human tissue in the United States. Um, donation is the preferred term of fertility clinics. You won't usually see an embryo adoption program through a clinic just because the clinic sees it as a medical procedure and not uh, an adoption process like it would be personifying the embryos. This is the only life giving solution for remaining embryos. Uh, this is the only way, the only option that doesn't destroy the embryos and, and they can be used for future transfers. Um, families who uh, choose to donate their embryos, they, a lot of them just want satisfaction of knowing that their donation helped another family achieve pregnancy and childbirth when that family otherwise would not have been able to do so themselves. All right, so how do you donate embryos? Well, there's more than one way. So the first one is privately. Um, so this is basically the sense that the donor and the recipient making connection on their own. Now this can be through personal relationships or even online like a Facebook group. Uh, a good way to think about this is DIY embryo donation. And why it's called DIY is essentially it is do it yourself. Um, so you do, you do everything yourself. You find the recipient yourself. You go through the legal process yourself. You figure out the logistics of the FDA requirements and the legal requirements and the shipping requirements by yourself. There's no mediating factor or mediating party helping with all of this on your behalf. So that's privately. The second option is donating the embryos through the fertility clinic donation program where they were created at. Uh, this is when the embryos are given to the fertility clinic, the ownership of the embryos transfers over to the facility, and that facility then gives those embryos to recipient families who are on a waiting list of that fertility clinic's donation program. Uh, this donation is completely anonymous, 
again, because clinics tend to see this as a medical procedure. So they handle it, everything under HIPAA. So everything's anonymous, everything's closed. The donor will not know any information about the recipient or vice versa, and there is no communication. The third option would be uh, donating them through an adoption program. Now this can be through an adoption agency or a separate embryo adoption organization that is separate from a fertility clinic. The organization may be affiliated with a certain fertility clinic, but the actual process of going through the um, donation process is, is not part of the actual medical facility. These programs will usually help facilitate matching legal requirements, clinic coordination, meeting FDA requirements, and future communication as desired. So which donation route is right for you and your embryos? Well, it depends on what you want. Um, there are Obviously, there's more questions than just the four here that you would want to ask, but these are definitely four you should take into consideration. First one being, are you hoping for an anonymous or a designated donation? Designated means you know of or you even choose the family who receives your embryos. If you're hoping for anonymous, probably want to go through a fertility clinic donation program where the, the, the same program or the same clinic where your embryos were created. If you want a designated donation matching privately or going through an embryo adoption program would be a better route. The second question is what criteria or preferences do you have for the donation? So if you actually want to choose or you have preferences of the family who would receive your embryos, you would want to go through the private route or through an embryo adoption program. If that is something that you really don't, don't worry about or not really care about, going through a fertility clinic donation program would be a good route. If you know somebody who is actually looking for embryos, that could be the door um, opening to match privately. Um, and even if you do match privately, a lot of times some embryo donation, uh, I'm sorry, embryo adoption programs will allow you both to enter through their program, then if you meet their requirements and help facilitate with all the legal work, clinic coordination, FDA requirements on, on your behalf for a reduced fee. So you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, you still match privately, but don't have the DIY version of it. And the final, uh, final question you may want to consider is, do your embryos meet qualifications for some embryo donation and adoption programs? This is a big one and probably the more, most important one you want to consider. If your embryos have been, fro have been frozen for seven or more years, it is going to be very difficult to find any program or any private matched family who would wanna receive those embryos um, just because of the age that they have been frozen. There is no research to suggest that embryos frozen for any length of time have any effect on the viability or chance for success of those embryos. Um, some programs still have those qualifications in place. Um, the longer the embryos are stored, as well is um, also an indication of how easy it would be to access the records associated with those embryos as fertility clinics will destroy records after seven years most times. If you for some reason do, do not meet the qualifications of your fertility clinic donation program and embryo adoption program may be able to help you facilitate um, the donation process or maybe you could even find a family who would be able to match privately but you always want to check with any embryo donation or adoption program, what their qualifications are for receiving embryos. And if you have on hand and are easily, and the paperwork associated with those embryos are easily accessible. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the other side now, the embryo adoption side or the recipient side. Why use the term adoption even to begin with? Well, the hopeful end result of any embryo donation process is a child. Families are not going through embryo donation programs or adoption programs to receive embryos, and then they're just holding those embryos close to the chest, not going to use them for, for anything. There's, they just want them. They want to hold them. That's not what happens. These embryos are, well, these families are wanting to use these embryos for transfers, to achieve pregnancy, to have a baby, and to raise a child. The definition of adoption technically is uh, taking a child into your home who is not biologically related to yourself and raising that child as your own. So this term makes more emotional sense to recipients and adequately describes how the child came into their family. And this is why many families choose to receive embryos through an adoption agency or an embryo adoption program, because these programs 
are practicing the best practices of adoption, again, goes back to how it describes how that child enters this family's home, because that child is not going to be biologically related to his or her parents. Other descriptions of or aspects of embryo adoption are an embryo adoption implements the best practices of traditional adoption to protect all parties involved. This includes home studies, education, criminal background review, uh, knowledge and communication with the parties, which protects all parties involved. Um, an embryo adoption also gives the power of choice to donor family and adoptive families. It's not just an anonymous giving an embryo to a recipient family. It's the donor families have choice on who receives their embryos. The adoptive family has a choice on whose embryos they, they get. Um, everybody's voices are heard in an embryo adoption process. An embryo adoption also encourages knowledge and communication between donor and adoptive families. Uh, the communication arrangements can be set up in terms of what is best for each family. Some may choose to just do medical emergency only. Some may choose to be direct. We'll go over the different options later. Uh, but communication and knowledge are power when it comes to the world of adoption. And that's where everybody feels most secure is, is knowing what you need to know and there's no questions. And finally, an embryo adoption allows adoptive families to experience pregnancy and childbirth which might not have been possible through their own IVF cycles or through going through a traditional adoption process. And embryo adoption gives this option to families who may have been in that situation. Okay, so let's talk about the recipients or the adoptive parents real quick here. So who are they? Where did they come from? Well, lots of different people decide to adopt embryos. And this includes, but is not limited to, you know, couples and individuals who are searching for solutions to their infertility diagnosis, um, maybe families who may not have been able to afford their own IVF or other infertility treatments, or maybe just have been burnt out from their own IVF or infertility treatments. These can come from uh, families who may have decided against uh, egg donation or sperm donation because of the cost or personal beliefs or what have you. Um, and many, like I said before, may have already attempted their own IUI or IVF cycles unsuccessfully to no fruition. So embryo adoption is the, is the next step. Um, other families uh, or other instances, maybe families who want to adopt and still experience pregnancy, but they like the idea of having prenatal control um, of, for, their, for their baby's environment, as opposed to going through domestic infant adoption or, or international, and you just do not know or have a say on what happened to that child during uh, the prenatal, prenatal process, pregnancy process. And, you know, we have other family, other families decide to adopt embryos that have never faced infertility and it's just the adoption process that is right for them. So all sorts of families, all sorts of different backgrounds decide to pursue embryo adoption. Okay, so the first question we almost always get is how to begin the embryo adoption process. What steps do I need to take? What program is the right fit for me? What aspects do I need to consider? The very first thing you should do before beginning to look into any program specifically is schedule an appointment with your OBGYN or a fertility doctor to verify you are able to carry a pregnancy. Some programs will allow families to use a surrogate, others will not. It is still good to know where you stand at this very beginning to know if this is even an option for you. You will also want to research different programs to find the one that meets your personal criteria. Every single embryo adoption and donation program out there will have different eligibility requirements. They'll have different costs and fee structures. They'll have different travel requirements. Some might require a home study or a criminal background check or a psychological evaluation. Um, the list goes on. So always be sure to research and see what different programs have what different characteristics associated with them. You will also want to determine what communication you want to have with your matched family. This will also depend which program you want to go through. If you are hoping for some sort of communication with the family, you may opt to go through a private match or a match through an embryo adoption program. 
Um, if you really do not want communication with the family, you're most likely going to want to go through a fertility clinics donation program. And finally, and the very most important thing you would probably want to consider is you want to verify the program or clinic has current or reliable access to donated embryos. For example, you might find a program that meets all your personal criteria in terms of eligibility, cost, travel requirements, etc. But the clinic really doesn't have that or the clinic or donation program or adoption program just doesn't have reliable access to donated embryos, in which case you're just going to be waiting for a very long time for a match. So that's always something to double check as well. Just make sure that they actually have embryos to, to match you with. So what qualifications should you be looking at if you are thinking of receiving embryos through an embryo adoption or donation program? Like we said before, the first one is medical. Uh, you want to see what their uh, requirements are medically for the adoptive mother. Uh, usually the adoptive mother must provide confirmation she's able to carry pregnancy to full term without complications. Another word for this is contraindications. And I said before, some programs will allow families to use the services of a gestational carrier, but that is not very many programs out there. So you do need to look to see if that might be an option for you. Another qualification you might or criteria you might want to see um, or look into is whether or not the program requires a home study. Many embryo adoption programs will require the completion of a full adoption home study. Some might be okay receiving a, a, a expedited or a specific embryo adoption home study on your behalf. Others want to see a traditional home study through the state. It just depends on the program. Uh, the program itself may offer this service or they might refer you to an outside provider. Uh, some programs uh, like I mentioned before, we'll only require a criminal background check or a psychological evaluation. So that's always good to check to see if you need to get a full-blown adoption home study done or just a criminal background check. And travel as well. Some embryo adoption programs have an established fertility clinic or group of fertility clinics that they work with for their frozen embryo transfers. This may require you to complete the transfer preparation remotely and travel to the clinic. So always good to see if you're required to travel or not. And then every program has other miscellaneous um, qualifications or criteria for their family. So they're all going to have their own age requirement, their own marriage requirement. Some may accept single women, some may not. It's always good to check up on these when checking into embryo adoption programs. All right, fees and expenses. Usually all costs involved are going to be covered by the adoptive family. Um, usually donors are not charged for donating their embryos because, again, it's in the sense of they are giving a gift to the recipient family, so they should not be charged anything for the donation process. Most costs are covered by the adoptive family. Now, this can be incurred if you're going through the private route. This can be incurred as you go, or if this is through a, a, a donation program, it might be an upfront fee, or if it's an adoption program, it might be a pay as you go, depending on um, if they charge kind of all, the a la carte method, or if it's a full, like all-inclusive payment. Again, every program is different. The fees may cover, but are not limited to application and administrative costs, matching fees, legal and attorney fees, embryo shipment to another facility if required, home study costs, travel costs, medical testing and FET procedure, and of course, education and counseling um, required either before, after, or during uh, the process. Okay, so another big question we get is why is a home study even necessary for an embryo adoption donation process? It is not legally required, so why do programs sometimes require it? Require it? There's several different reasons. The biggest one definitely is it gives the donor families who are donating to the program peace of mind that the recipient family or the adoptive family they're matching with has been fully vetted, vetted and has gone through education about adoption and embryo adoption and how to parent an adopted child. So that gives donor families peace of mind. In terms of benefits for the adoptive family, it's an evaluation just to make sure the family is in a safe and stable place to place a child into their home. 
It educates the family on the embryo adoption process and how to raise an adoptive child. And it also makes adoptive families feel prepared for what's to come, feel prepared for the adoption process, feel prepared for the medical and FET procedure, prepared for pregnancy, prepared to uh, parent an infant, an adopted infant into their home. And like I said before, while some embryo donation and adoption programs do not require an adoption home study, they will instead require a criminal background check. Uh, most for fertility clinic donation programs will actually require their patients to complete a psychological evaluation. Even if you're, even if you decide to go with a program that doesn't require an adoption home study, you will need to do some sort of background or psych evaluation just so the program can confirm that uh, you are in a stable situation to place a child into your home. All right, communication options. And I said earlier we would go over what this looks like. So there is different forms of communication. There's not a one box fits all situation, even though I have it in three, we have it in three boxes here. Um, but everything can kind of be, it's like a give and take and can be flexible. So even though you might be want to start out in one area, it doesn't mean that that can't be moved to another area later down the line, or um, that it, it can't be a little bit of both. So the main different choices or options are closed, anonymous, or emergency only. The second option is facilita facilitated or third-party mediation. The fourth option is direct or having open communication arrangement. So closed or anonymous. This is when there's usually no choice in the recipient or the donor um, and who who gives what you're kind of you're, you're kind of just presented with embryos and you're like okay these are the embryos you have available do you want them or not. You don't know who the who the donor family is likewise the donors don't know that their embryos are being offered so there's no knowledge or future communication with this type of match. Um, facilitated, there usually is a choice for donor and recipient placement. Sometimes there isn't. It just depends on the program. The communication in a facilitated um, a communication arrangement is relayed using an outside entity or some sort of third party. So the, the donor and the recipient family are in communication directly with each other, but rather they're using a mediated means to do the communication. And like I said, the communication arrangement varies. You could be very communicative with each other and have a third party facilitator, or you might be very um, once a year only if that sends you an update when I have a question or a concern or something that is still a facilitated communication. And then finally, the direct or open communication, there's almost always a choice in recipient and the donor family. They choose each other, they agree to match with each other, they handle the, the communication directly. Again, the communication can vary. You can be very hands-off and maybe send an update or so directly when you're you have a question or a concern, or you could be communicating, you know, just like old family friends would. So again, var varies between different families, different matches. All right, we're going to go through the frozen embryo transfer process now. What does that look like? Now, you might be very aware of what this looks like. This might be your first time going over what it might entail, but a very, very brief um, overview or synopsis as, of it. It's kind of broken up into five parts. So you first schedule your frozen embryo transfer. So you meet with a reproductive endocrinologist or an RE to determine preparation requirements and schedule your frozen embryo transfer. So they will um, meet with you. This might be your first time meeting with them or it might be the uh, 20th visit with them. Um, but this is when you would decide like, okay, what kind of cycle preparation do we wanna do? When do we wanna aim for? What do we wanna do to get ready for the transfer? So we get that on, you get that on the books, you get that schedule. After that, it's cycle preparation. So with the RE, you determine if you can do a natural or a medicated cycle. Natural meaning there's really no medications. It just follows the natural cycle of the mother or medicated meaning there are some um, hormone replacement therapy involved. The preparation time can take up to six weeks depending on which, uh, or which cycle you decide to do and how much preparation is needed. On the day of transfer, FET day, the embryos are thawed. And like I said previously in an earlier slide, it only takes about one to two minutes to thaw the embryos in the straw. 
At this time, this is when the embryologists can determine if the embryos are viable. So today, embryos have about a 70 to 80% thaw success rate. Um, others would even say that would be higher depending on uh, the type of freezing method used to, to thaw your embryos. But a very, very high, most, your, most of your embryos will survive the thaw. So the transfer takes place, simple outpatient procedure, um, the mother is sent on her merry way. Two weeks later, a beta test is scheduled, um, or I should say like the beta test is scheduled for two weeks out from that time. So the beta test is when a, there's a simple blood test, blood is drawn to test for the HCG hormone or the pregnancy hormone. If it is identified in the mother's lab work, uh, another test will be ordered two days from now to make sure the numbers are doubling. If the numbers are doubling, that means that the, um, uh, the embryo has implanted and a pregnancy has occurred. If the numbers are not doubling and instead decreasing, the mother is losing the pregnancy. If they're kind of stagnant, um, again, it could not be, uh, it, it could just mean that the, the pregnancy may not progress. Um, what they're looking for is that those numbers are doubling your second blood test. So what are your next steps after this? If the uh, blood test was positive for pregnancy for the HCG hormone doubling, uh, the patient will be monitored for a few weeks at the clinic before being released to an OBGYN for the normal run-of-the-mill prenatal care, depending on their situation. If the test was negative, they will most likely meet with the RE to discuss what happened, what was going on, and that's when a second FET will be discussed or scheduled during that time, depending on what, um, what the patients and the doctor deems appropriate. Right. So there are a lot more resources on everything you need to know about embryo donation and adoption. We hit on a lot of topics today, but that definitely doesn't mean there's more information out there. We do have available resources on our websites, embryoadoption.org and snowflakes.org. Below here are some books you may want to consider, Frozen But Not Forgotten, Three Makes Baby, Snowflake Named Hannah. Great for anybody who's interested in considering embryo uh, adoption or donation. Um, and even the third book there, Three Makes Baby, is great for um, learning how to tell your kids uh, they were donor conceived e either through embryo donation or through egg donor and an IVF cycle. So great for both sides, uh, for both embryo donation and adoption parties. It's also all great books for kids as well to tell them how they came to your family through the process of embryo um, adoption, Snowflake's Bakes. Snowflake Baby, You Were Meant for Me, and The Pea That Was Me are great places to start, but that's definitely not the only ones out there about embryo adoption or donation and, and children's books. There is a plethora out there of different options for you to choose from. And that is the ending of our video today. We hope we answered a lot of questions that you might have had, as well as um, maybe answered some questions you didn't know you would have. If you have any additional questions that you still need to have answered or just come up with, you're more than welcome to contact us. Like I said, you can comment down below or you can uh, call us at that phone number on the screen, as well as uh, visit our website, or even shoot us an email at info at embryoadoption.org or info at snowflakes.org. And one of us will be able to get back to you with any answers that you might have. Uh, but we hope you took away a lot of good information about the embryo donation and adoption process. And we look forward to potentially helping you on your journey.